Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with two boxes you're going to want to know about. One is the tribute, the homage to Dennis Brain, the great horn player of the 1950s in the UK and the rest of the world. This is on Warner. And this fabulous disc of French horn concertos on brilliant classics by more composers than you'll ever want to know, many of whom you've never heard of. And that's really uh, 10 discs of French horn there. And, oh, I don't know, 11 here. Although I think one of them is one of those, no, no, it's 11 discs. Good, it's not one of those bonus things where they sit and talk, who cares, right? So uh, let's talk a little bit about the French horn because this offers us an opportunity to make some op observations about the classical music world in general. Now, the French horn is an absolutely splendid instrument, famously treacherous and extraordinarily difficult to master. The people who play it are enormously talented. There is no question about it, but it doesn't have a lot of great repertoire written by major composers. And the reason is not really hard to understand. For much of its life, the French horn was a natural instrument. In other words, it didn't have valves, it couldn't play in that many keys, it was limited in what it could do. In the Baroque period, of course, you had people who learned to play very virtuoso music, you know, at the very top of, of the horn's register, in that high, high-pitched descant reg register, as it was called, and they were, they were amazing if they actually played what was written for them on the horn. There's some, some question as to what instrument was actually used and whether or not the word horn could mean anything that was a brass instrument. But, you know, there are a couple of concertos by Haydn. There are the four by Mozart, the two by Strauss. That is essentially the modern horn repertoire. I mean, there's a, there's a concerto by Glier. There's, there's short pieces by a whole bunch of people. And the reason is because the horn is a terribly tiring instrument to play. And even though, you know, it has glorious solos in an orchestral context, they're, they're beautiful by means of contrast by means of the fact that you don't hear the horn constantly playing. And so when it does play, and it's given magnificent music, and for example, a, a symphony by Bruckner, <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> one of those things, or, or, or the slow movement of Tchaikovsky's fifth, it's, it's just magnificent. The, the second subject is Dvorak's cello concerto. There's so many famous passages written for the horn but not a lot of great solo concerti. And the ones that are written, they have to be a reasonable length because until recently, I mean, nowadays we have these, you know, Herculean, you know, French horn, you know, sort of like stud professional wrestlers. They are the, they are the, 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 you know, haystack Calhouns of classical music. Some of you may remember who that was. People with, you know, lots of stamina and energy and who were really strong and showy. But, you know, in those days, no. So, you know, 15 minutes was pushing it as the length of your average horn concerto because, first of all, the instrument itself was very fatiguing. And second of all, because it was a natural horn without valves. And second of all, uh, the, the players themselves only had a limited amount of energy to put into performing. And when an, an instrument is that limited, the best composers are not going to be able to do their best work. And so none of them did. There are no great horn concerti. I say that with complete certainty compared to the best work of the composers who wrote them. I mean, Mozart's four horn concertos are amazingly popular and they're lovely works, but are they the best things that Mozart ever did in the concerto form? No. Haydn's two horn concerti? No. Strauss's two horn concerti? Are they better than Die Frau und Schatten? No. Or Salome? which has six horns going nuts in it? No. And that's, that's just the situation. And it's something, unfortunately, that horn players have to kind of live down because they are among the most talented and the, the most readily identifiable, timbrely, you know, players in the orchestra with, a, with, a, with an instrument that deserves universal respect, and yet they don't have a lot of great music written for them. And so that's something to consider. And now, of course, with the period instrument movement, we have a whole slew of players performing on the natural instrument. 
which is a whole nother thing because natural horns basically sound just terrible. I mean, the reason they have vowels is because it makes them easier to play. Now, some have maintained, as for example, Richard Strauss's father did, that the tone of the natural horn was uniformly superior to that of the instrument with vowels. Uh, that may have been true in the 19th century. I suspect it is not true today. Um, because we can hear natural horns versus instruments with valves. And I don't think there's anybody playing a natural horn who is going to be said to sound better that way. I mean, Brahms also, his, his you know horn trio was written for a natural horn. They were said to prefer it that way. Of course, we don't really know what those instruments did and what the players did. We have no idea. But here is, just to give you a sample here, I have here a natural horn. Here is the natural horn. And, you know, a French horn is one of these suckers that's been rolled up, only it's much longer than this. This is, this is short compared to the length of a horn. I mean, a horn is many feet of tubing all rolled up so that you could get a range of usable notes. And in order to play in different keys, what you do with French horns is you replace, uh, if you don't have valves, you, take, you replace lengths of tubing with different other lengths of tubing. Those are called crooks. And that would allow you to play in different keys. But doing that takes a good bit of time. And so most horn concertos do not involve many changes of crook. And if you if you play this thing, I mean, this, I don't even have a mouthpiece here. I mean, I can, I can do this for actually, you know, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah purposes. But, you know, let's just take, let's just take a Mozart horn concerto here. Let's see, let's see what we can do here with this thing. You see, that's what's going to happen. They're very difficult to play. <laughs> I think I've demonstrated that con conclusively. And, and of course, this is not a French horn. This is more of an Israeli horn, <laughs> if you want to call it that, a biblical horn. But they're, they're, they're atrociously difficult, and the repertoire is correspondingly limited. So let's not kid ourselves. That's one point I wanted to make about the instrument. We just have to accept it. However much you love it, it's, it's a limited instrument, a limited solo instrument that does not have the best music written for it as a solo instrument. It has some of the greatest music in the universe written for it as an orchestral instrument, which is a different matter. So now, let's take a look at this. And here's the second point I want to make. Dennis Brain was a tremendously gifted horn virtuoso. Everybody admits it. Everybody thinks he's wonderful. Is he the greatest horn player that ever lived? Heck no. Is he better than all the horn players around today? Absolutely not. But part of the problem in making that determination is that deciding what a great horn player is is not an easy thing. What is it about him that was great? His legato? His timbre? Can you identify the sound of a French horn the way you identify the sound of a violin? Well, I know certain French horn players who certainly can. And of course, there are schools of French horn play. The Viennese school, the school of which Dennis Brain was a part, which is broadly speaking, the German school. They all crap on the French school or the Czech school with their, you know, greater vibrato and more saxophone-like tone quality. I happen to think that has character. That doesn't bother me a bit. But there was a period in time, especially in the 40s and 50s, in the immediate post-war period, when the timbre of orchestral instruments was starting to become more homogenized. And, and that was a timbral ideal. And so we were taught or told that horn timbres that were different, and that includes, frankly, natural horn parts up to a point, at least as long as they're reasonably in tune, and, and they don't have so many stop tones that it's buzzing and, you know, obviously having difficulty. But even in that sense, our school of listening to brass instruments does not encourage variety of tone, particularly if you listen to brass players, because they're incredibly loyal to the school in which they were trained and to their teachers and their traditions, and they necessarily say that everybody else's tradition sucked. And as listeners, we have the right to enjoy whatever we feel like. And so, number one, um, do not assume that this guy is the, the be-all and end-all of French horn tone. I don't think that that's fair, number one. Number two, uh, is he better than everyone who came later in the same repertoire? Every horn player who's ever made a solo record has done the Mozart horn concertos and the Strauss horn concertos. Are they, are they inferior to Dennis Brain? 
No, they're not. First of all, because the music is not such that it's going to tax the virtuosity of these people who are so good these days to any untoward degree, number one. Number two, it's not great music to begin with. It's pleasant music is what it is, diverting music. So there's, that's number two. And number three, there is such inertia in the world of classical recordings. I, I'm very conscious of it because, you know, we're getting all of these boxes of dead conductors and I sit around telling you all how wonderful they are. And, and people ask quite fairly, well, what about now? Are there any great conductors around today? And I always answer in the affirmative, of course there are. There are conductors who do wonderful, wonderful things today. And, and we've heard some of the more recently dead conductors, more recent conductors. You know, Charles McCarris, who was only recently deceased. Manfred Hernick, until recently, you know, who did fabulous stuff. Um, you know, there, there are terrific conductors. Esa Pekas Allen, I think, is as fine a conductor as anybody alive these days. So, yes, there are wonderful living musicians making great records that I look forward to hearing, that you look forward to hearing, that we all want all want to see released. It's not as if there's nothing but like dead people around, but there really is huge, huge inertia in the classical record industry. Once somebody has decided that there's a classic recording of something, there is a great tendency to stop listening. And this is particularly true of the repertoire for an unusual instrument like the horn. And I understand it. It's a question of time. Once you find a great artist, like as Dennis Brain certainly was, who does all the basic horn repertoire, and you know it, and it becomes your standard, why would you bother listening to more? Especially if the music isn't sensational to begin with. Just get one that's terrific, say that's the standard, nobody else matches it, and that's the end of it. But the fact is, it's hard to find a bad recording of the Mozart Horn Concerti. It really is. I mean, do you think Barry Tuckwell is... is is you know worse than Dennis Brain was, or is it Dennis Tischler, or 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 Myron Bloom, or you know any of these people? They were they were wonderful, wonderful players, or the Reese, or or people who are making recordings nowadays, who are fantastic musicians, and they can play these pieces as well as Dennis Brain ever did. They do. It's an audible fact. So. So I, I, I just don't want you to be disappointed if you think you're going to get 11 discs of Dennis Brain and put it on, you're going to go, aha, you're going to hear something that you've never heard before in the wonderfulness of the horn playing. It's not true. It's not true. And some of these things, you know, they're, most of them are mono. They're older sounding recordings. And so, yeah, they're classics. They are classics of their kind, but they are not the be-all and end-all in that repertoire, not by any stretch of the imagination. And just the fact that Dennis Brain's name remains such an iconic one in the history of his instrument tells us that it's not an, interest, interest, an instrument about which there's a lot interesting to say, or else there would be many more names. I mean, imagine, imagine talking about the iconic violinist for the past, you know, 80 years and limiting it to one person, or a pianist, you know, or a cellist, <laughs> or any of the instruments that have a certain range of, of, of expressive potential, a clarinetist. I mean, it's, it's really very, very difficult. And when you get to brass instruments, it's, it's, it's more complicated than that. It's just a very complex subject. So I'm going to leave it at that and tell you what's in here. There's a lot of duplication of repertoire, and there are a lot of excerpty type things. So I, I just want to give you, run down the list of repertoire. For example, okay, Mozart. We get, um, this, this first disc is not with Dennis at all, actually. This is with his dad, Aubrey Brain, who was also a horn player. And uh, it's a bunch of Mo it's Mozart, Divertimento 17, Mozart Horn Concerti 2 and 4, and the uh, Aria Per Pietà Per Me, which has a, um, or pe I'm sorry, Per Pietà Ben Mio, which has the big horn solo from Così Fan Tutti. And uh, that's, that's Aubrey Brain, the dad. Disc two, we start to get um, Dennis. Dennis pops up here. Where is he? Yep, there he is with the Dennis Brain Wind Ensemble. And you get his Beethoven's Opus 17, the Horn Sonata in F Major, Strauss Horn Concerto, Mozart Divertimento Number 10, Schumann's Adagio and Allegro, um, Mozart Aria, again, you know, the same one, Per Pietà. Uh, the first movement of Haydn's Horn Signal Symphony, but only the first movement, the Nocturne from Mendelssohn's A Midsummer Night's Dream, the introduction, the, the, the 
the, the part two prelude to Delius's A Massive Life. I mean, okay, let, let's talk, talk talkless here. If you're playing a solo instrument and you're reduced on a highlight CD to using the introduction to part two of Delius's The Massive Life, then you're in trouble. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just the reality of the situation. <laughs> Wagner's Siegfried's Horn Call. But of course, no, nothing else. And Paul Ducas' little villanelle for horn solo. CD3 has got more Mozart, the wind quintet on a, uh, the musical joke, um, and and uh, the wind quintet twice, the quintet for piano winds in E flat major. Yes, there's two different recordings of it on the same record, one from 1954 and one from 1955, and divertimento number 14. You know, I'm not even going to go through all this stuff because it's, you're going to get tons and tons of duplication. And a lot of it is horn ensemble music, chamber music with the horn in there. But to be honest with you, th there's not even that much, that much, I think, sort of variety of repertoire. It's classical wind music and wind ensemble music and familiar stuff. I mean, there's not even a Reicha wind quintet in here. You know, you, you'd think there would be some more interesting stuff in here. CD5 is kind of cool. I mean, you only get the Mendelssohn like Nocturne 50 times and whatever, the Quonium from the B minor mass. Okay, it's got a horn solo. What are you going to say about it? And I mean, when was the last time you heard the horn solo in the Quonium from Bach's B minor mass played badly? But CD5 has Lennox Berkeley's uh, horn trio, or Barkley, whatever they call them in the UK, Hindemith's horn concerto, which is dry as dust as a piece, um, Gordon Jacobs' sextet for piano and winds, and the Jacques Hibert trois pièces breve, which is really a nice disc. You get the four last songs with Elizabeth Schwarzkopf conducted by Herbert von Karajan. I mean, they're not, it's not a horn piece. I mean, yes, there's a beautiful horn solo. Lovely. Lovely. It's wonderful. Terrific. Um, and let's see, some Handel stuff, and so CPE Bach. You do get these little CPE Bach things. They're cute. The six sonatinas for wind instruments. I like anything by CPE Bach. And Dittersdorf's Partita in D major. So that's interesting. And uh, let's see, you get the Dvorak Serenade, the Gounod Petit Symphony, and the Strauss Sonatina Number no. 2, the Happy Workshop, with the members of the London Baroque Ensemble under Karl Haas. Okay, performances, not going to win any awards. And if you can, you can point out the part with Dennis Brain, <laughs> go ahead, knock yourself out. And then the last disc has got like all kinds of short little things, some of which are interesting. Richard Arnell, Serenade for 10 Wins in Double Bass, the, the Strauss Suite for 13 Wins, Dandon, uh, Vincent Dandy's Chanson et Danse. You know, these are all ensemble pieces in which Dennis Brain participates. So they're nice to have. They really are. And look, he deserves a tribute. There's no, I, I, I'm not questioning any of that. I'm not questioning him. I'm not questioning his ability. I'm not questioning, him, questioning his importance. Um, I think that the, that the reverence in which he's held is, well, he's sort of like the Kathleen Ferrier of the horn. You know, he died young, which is, there is nothing Nothing the English love more than dead young artists that they can be sentimental and and talk about endlessly. And that's another thing about it. You should not let the reputation of Dennis Brain overshadow all the fabulous work that's been done with French horns since he died, which is a lot, a great deal. So yes, if you're a horn aficionado, you will want this set. There's no question about it. You will want it. But is it like, you know, just understand what I've said about this, the, the instrument and its history and, and what goes on here, because I, I think it's important. I think it's important always that we listen critically and always that we not close our ears to more recent developments and newer things. And that's particularly true of the French horn, because what is developed? I mean, if there are great horn concertos being written, they're not going to be old. They're going to be new works. They're going to be contemporary works. They really are because because there isn't anything. There isn't anything really old that um, I think challenges today's foreign virtuosi and has has represented, you know, just a shatteringly imperishable masterpiece for the instrument. I think the great horn music is yet to come.
That's my feeling. And speaking of which, we have 10 CDs from Brilliant Classics um, dedicated to horn concertos by, get this, Beer, Fosch, Fiala, Fitt, Forster, J. Haydn, Michael Haydn, Heinichen, Lortzing, Mozart, Pfluger, Bacorny, Kvantz, Reicher, Rossetti, Sasson, Schuch, Schumann, Sperger, Strauss, Telemann, Vivaldi, Weber, and Zalenka. They're not concertos. A lot of them are just horn pieces that, you know, or orchestral pieces that have prominent horn parts in them. But what could be bad? I mean, I don't even have to go through this disc by disc. If you like the horn, you will want this. This is fun. This is really fun. But I do want to make a point, a point about the, her the, the horn repertoire. One of the great, great horn composers was, was um, this guy, Rossetti. I keep forgetting what his first name was. Let me find out. Wait a minute. He's on disc, disc, uh, what is it? Disc eight here, I think. Eight, eight or nine, nine. And I have a sample here too, so so I can play it for you. Let me see, disc nine, there's Rossetti. Good old Mr. Rossetti. Francesco Antonio Rossetti, 1750 to 1792. He was an exact contemporary of Mozart. He probably wrote the best horn concerti of the classical period. He really did. They're very, very nice pieces. But the funny thing about it is one of these concerti is a concerto in D minor. And you think to yourself, wow, D minor. Because, you know, this, this thing, is it's an orgy of D major, E flat major. I mean, there's a little bit of F major. You know, those are like the three keys in which horn concerti tend to happen before they had valves. Because doing it in other keys was just too complicated and too difficult. It wouldn't get played. It just wouldn't get played. And so, and so I want to play you a little sample of the concerto in T minor to, to make a point. And uh, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So here, have a listen to the concerto in D minor by Rossetti. <laughs> Did you hear what I was talking about? This thing starts in a nice tense D minor. And then as soon as the horn comes in, poof, there goes the minor key. There goes all the Sturm und Drang. The horn's just tootling away in the usual horn key. And that's what happened in these horn concerti in the classical period. I mean, why he bothered with the D minor opening, I have no idea. It certainly sets up sets up expectations that the rest of the work doesn't fulfill, even though it's a very nice pleasant horn concerto for itself. And just for the record, the hornists in this collection are, let's see, performers include, here they are, Peter Dam, Andrew Joy, Felix, Felix Kleiser, is that the word? Yeah, Kleiser, yes, Kleiser, or Kleiser, or something like that. And Hermann Jorison, Jorison, Zdenek Tislar, he was really cool. And Biedrich Tislar, who's related to Zdenek, and they're really fine, fine musicians all, lovely performances, lots and lots of fun music featuring the horn, either alone or in groups or as an ensemble instrument. So this is fun. This is fun because it just has a lot of very nice repertoire in it. And if you like the sound of the horn, you'll hear it in all of this repertoire in one place or another. But again, it's a real indication. Ten discs of just concerti for solo horn, you're not going to find it. 
you're just not going to find it. I'm sure it exists. I mean, there's no question. You could dig them out somewhere, but has anybody bothered to record or play them? No, they haven't. And that's, that, is, that is the story of the French horn, I'm afraid. Um, like I said, I believe it's an instrument that has yet to have its full potential realized by a composer of genius. Um, I really, really think that that's true. So that's just another fabulous reason, in addition to owning these things, to keep on listening. So thank you for joining me, my friends. Take care.